Everybody's week was stellar. Um, hmm. This week got them working on me. Working, working, working. And there is a powerful word for the Lord today. Um, today's sermon is going to be a little different than most. Most sermons are informational. Most sermons require for the preacher to do the work. But the Lord said that you come into relationship with him by his spirit. And in coming in relationship by his spirit, the Spirit will do the work. The Spirit will challenge you today. The Spirit is going to ask you a question, probably a series of questions. And in that questioning, he said that he would reshape the way that you see Jesus. You would reshape the way that you interact with Jesus. You would reshape the expectations that you have of Jesus. Oddly enough, the revelation came in watching my children. And we rolled down the street. We're going to pray. Don't worry about it. But I kind of want to give you a gist of what's going on here to prepare you for what is about to take place today. But we're riding down the street. Um, playing some old music, you know, just vibing. And I'm looking to my left and I'm looking, in my rear, I'm looking to my right and in my rear view mirror. And I'm watching my children look like me, act like me, desire to be like me. And as I'm looking at this, I'm like, wow, that's a heck of an impact to want to look like, to want to act like. To like the things that I like by relationship. 
relationship. And it wasn't something that somebody told them. This was in observation. And that blew my mind. And the Lord said, if they do that, how easy would it be for my children for my brothers and sisters, my friends, to do that if they encountered me. And I was so skeptical of preaching this one. Andre, I tell you, I, I was on the back porch last night about 1.30 in the morning. And I'm like, this one's going to hurt because it literally shaped or reshape how I saw them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for fellowship. We thank you today for your spirit. We thank you for your consistency. We thank you for your very being. We thank you for being the proper example and a clear and defined example for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we invite your spirit in this place, and we declare a spirit of clarity and revelation to fall fresh upon us. We declare right now, in the name of Jesus, that uneasiness leave this place. We command it to go. We command the fears of our hearts to go. And we command your peace to rest and reside on us, in us, and through us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you for the opportunity to not only see ourselves, but to re-examine ourselves. For in your word, you said, examine yourselves daily. So we take this opportunity as a tune-up of sorts in our lives, a tune-up for our faith, a tune-up for our expectation and our love for you. Father, today we set a president right now, putting a demand upon you to change our revelation of how you exist in our lives of how you move in our lives, and even the limitations that we've placed on you within our lives. We cast out every religious demon that attempts to rear his ugly head. We bind you now by the blood of Jesus, and we loose the spirit of love, the spirit of liberty and revelation. We call upon you today, Father, for we need you. If there's anything in this room that does not belong to you, that is not like you, we ask that you remove it right now, that the exposure come forth, and that you fight the battle. For we shall not become weary in well-doing. We shall not become weary in our thoughts and in our practices of you. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. And we hold an expectation for you to move today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke. Going to the ninth chapter. Did you need a Bible? Ninth chapter. If we start at the 18th verse, it reads Now it happened as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowd? 
now say that I am. I stop right there. Anytime that we see a question in the Bible, that question must become personal. Because otherwise we're reading it as a story and it cannot take place or take root in our lives. So if we read that and we, we, we take the gist of it, I'll give you a backdrop rather than to read the whole text. Basically, Jesus had ordained or authorized empowered his disciples to go out and cast out demons. When they returned back, they all went upon the mountaintop and all the people followed him, approximately 5,000. There he fed the 5,000. After feeding them, Jesus went to pray. The disciples approached Jesus in the midst of his prayer, and Jesus all of a sudden stops. And he asks the people, the very people that were following him, that were walking closely with him, who do they say I am? The reasoning he asked this was because in order to get a clear picture of who Jesus is, we have to be able to distinguish ourselves from the world and the world's thinking. The world's thinking could not accept Jesus for who he was. They had to take a different pose or a different mindset to relate to him. If we go a little further in that scripture, it says, and they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. If we pay attention to this, the answers of the disciples, disciple being a key word because the disciple is a follower of Jesus. Everybody in this room is a disciple. So Jesus now asks you this question. Who do they say that I am? The disciples said John the Baptist, Elijah, or some other prophet that was risen. We're talking about Jesus, who in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Meaning Jesus being the Word was there at the beginning. All things are made in him and through him. Jesus being part of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Trinity. All one. Three different personalities. All one. They couldn't see him in the image of God. They couldn't see him in the spirit of God. They couldn't even see him near God. The closest they could come were the very people that he created. They had to compare the incomparable or uncomparable to a flawed man. short of his glory because all have sinned except for him. The comparison was Jesus is a sinner. He ain't no different than me or you, but he hear from God. That's who they said he was. But now Jesus is asking you, who do you say they are? Or better yet, who do they say that I am? The people in your life. Because if indeed the pathway of where we're thinking of Jesus is limited to Elijah, 
John the Baptist, Paul, Timothy, Peter, the preacher, your low everyday prophet. If that's the best you can give, how can things become impossible or everything be possible to you? Because now you put Jesus on this one-way street. You put the thought process of he really ain't Lord because I ain't going to serve Elijah. I ain't serving John the Baptist. I ain't serving Paul. Well, next scripture he asked Peter, well, if that's who they say I am, who do you say that I am? Peter's answer was, you are the Christ. That was something that was revealed to him. It was revealed. It ain't like, okay, well, Peter just jumped out and, bang, yeah, you Christ dude, because you that dude. We're talking about angry Peter cut off the, the centurion's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. That denied him three times. Told him, I got your back. And Jesus flat out told him, no, nah, you, you, you tripping. You're going to deny me. You're going to deny me. We talk about yet another flawed man, but he could see it because guess what? There's a revelation of Jesus that was exponential. There were too many possibilities for him to sit back and say, you like John the Baptist. You know what I'm saying? No, you like David. Well, you like Abraham. Well, you like this. Well, you like that. How many times in our lives have we put Jesus in a place of commonality? In that common mindset that says, well, serving Jesus is my morality or how I act. Serving Jesus is getting some stuff. But how deep is that relationship? How can you see that Jesus is the Christ when you had these men, 12 disciples, 11 of them didn't recognize him? Only one did. When the crowds could only see him compared to another. But it wasn't the fact of them getting to know him or getting near him or entering into him. It was what they heard. It was what they heard. How many times in our lives have we went to church, the preacher then told us, this is what Jesus will do, this is what Jesus ain't going to do, and this is this and this, and you can only see Jesus through the eyes of somebody else. You can only see Jesus through the eyes of where your situation is. You can only see Jesus through the eyes of, I got to overcome something. But I take you back to that car ride. Because my kids could see me as daddy. But they could also see me as friend. They could see me as an authoritative figure because I spend time. I have a relationship with them. That relationship will dictate how they open themselves up to me. So when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? How far do you open yourself up now? How far do you stay? Or better yet, how limited will you go? How many limitations will you put on? How many times have we said, I don't know, I think I can, no, I can't. But didn't consult him. How many times have we gotten to a panic situation, but we didn't talk to him? 
when it was out of our control, that's when we yelled, Jesus. When it became an emergency situation, that's when we could call on Jesus. But otherwise, if we could fix it with our hands, or our mouths, or our minds, he had no access. He's king of kings, he's lord of lords. And if he's in you all the time, that means you're a subject of him all the time. Which means that you would have a relationship with him all the time. I'm not pointing a finger because I'm guilty. But in the process of this, we have to pattern our thought processes and change our minds about how we view Jesus. Because we were told a certain thing here. We were told a certain thing there. See, it's kind of funny. If you think about it, many of us go on mama or grandmama them Jesus or what they believe Jesus for. Some of us, we sit back and we think about it and grandmama them they, Jesus, was there to free them in a civil rights oppression. So they only needed Jesus for civil rights. You have some that needed Jesus for poverty. You have some that needed Jesus to get out of a relationship, to break some ties. But that's the only pathway that you allow Jesus to walk with you on. Because our mindset said, eh? he's like John the Baptist. He's like Elijah. He's like some other prophet. Well, Elijah was the prophet of miracles. When I see miracles, it's all good. But if I ain't seeing miracles, it ain't Jesus. Oh, well, I go about my way. If it ain't a miraculous situation, I'm going to go about my way. Some people think of Jesus in this, oh, he's just so lovey-dovey. And his daddy is just me. Let me shut up before God strike me down. This question that Jesus is posing to us is a question that takes us to a new realm in him where it brings us to a fear of the Lord. Not the fear of I'm trembling because I'm afraid, but it's a fear because I honor him in all my thoughts. In all my deeds, in all my works, that honor is now lacking, so now you are now deceived because of what you heard. Faith comes by hearing it, hearing the word of God. The problem being, what if all this time the image that you had of Jesus? was a dressed up lie. And I'm not trying to preach heresy to you. I'm not trying to preach you away from Jesus. But the key is, you hear so many people say, you've got to have a relationship. You've got to have a relationship. The problem being, if I only heard about what Jesus was, it ain't my relationship. It's mamas. It's grandmamas. It's granddaddies. Is Dr. King or whoever the preacher may be that day. Again, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The way that you come into a relationship is one through the Word, because you got to know its characteristics so that you can't be deceived, so that you can't be tricked. So you can't be hoodwinked and bamboozled by the smooth talker, by the entertainer, by that performance. You can't be tricked by the tradition that says, this is the way that you have to do church every Sunday. This is the way that you have to pray every time you pray. This is the way that you have to go to God. There is no recipe. But according to what 
11 of the 12 disciples were saying, his followers, there were. That was a recipe. He had to be compared to something because that's the only way they can relate. Well, relate is the key word of relationship, but a relationship goes two ways, not one. In the word religion, the word religion says, this is the way that I relate to God. That's all religion really is. It's the science of being able to relate to God. But that's man's explanation. Wait a minute. Pay attention. First question was, who do they say I am? What are we now entering into? Have we put, put ourselves in an agreement point with religion? Or a two-way relationship with him. Let's find out. Turn to Acts the 17th chapter. This might, like I say, it, it's a tough one, and it's a it's a, it's a bit bit meat to chew on, but it's a question that we have to begin to ask ourselves in which to grow closer. 17. And we'll start at the 16th verse. Now I want you to think of one thing in this moment before I begin to read. How many times have you walked into a church or even someone's home and you saw various things that could be labeled as shrines. Those shrines we can call altars, but we can also call them idols. Okay? So in that, I want you to pay attention to this particular scripture. It says... The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away. I'm sorry, wrong verse. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be preaching a foreign divinity or a foreign god. They may read in your Bible. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now that all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. For I have passed along and observed the objects of your worship. And I also found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, I proclaim to you. The God who made this world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. See, since he, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries 
of all their dwelling places. That they should seek God in the hope that they may feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Backdrop. Little history in this. Athens, Greece. You're sitting back, you're dealing with a whole bunch of folks that know it all. They're established people. There were some Jews there. They knew the law. But you had some devout Christians there, which we would call disciples. But they weren't preaching the resurrection of Jesus. They weren't preaching the revelation of Jesus. They weren't preaching Jesus. These people were called Epicureans. As a general breakdown, these were folks that believed in seeing signs and wonders. Stuff that was tangible. Then you had your Stoics, which were folks of morality. They believed that through your good works, that's how you were going to get to heaven. They related themselves to a thought process that said, that's the Jesus that I know. In so many words, Paul recognized who they said Jesus was. But Paul went there and the word that the Bible used was reasoned. Which means that he didn't go there just preaching. They were holding a dialogue back and forth. So now you have a different type of preaching going on. Kind of like what we, we do when we in service. You can ask your questions and I'll answer I can ask a question and you'll answer. They're reasoning with one another so that this crazy view that they don't understand, this Jesus that he's preaching, what type of Jesus he's preaching, because they ain't quite got that view yet. See, again, they're dealing on what other folks had told them. Yet to experience the Jesus of healing. You have to deal with the Jesus of peace. You have to deal with the Jesus of war. You have to deal with the Jesus of kindness, of comfort, of compassion. See, in a religious realm, they fashioned Jesus. They dressed him up the way they needed him to look. But the strange part about Jesus is he meets the need right where you are. In the scripture in Luke, he had just fed the 5,000 that went up on the hill, on the mountaintop, and it was daybreak. They, they spoke the sun about to set. And the disciples are saying, set them on, we ain't got no food for them. Jesus said, I'll meet the need right there. Don't worry about it. See, the, the, the Jesus that we preach is all oh, this glorious, 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 glorious God. But how can we look at Jesus, the man, that had to walk and deal with the same things we walk and deal with daily, when we've already set them so high that we can't reach them? The scripture said he ain't far from you. But they had all these different symbols of how Jesus was supposed to look and Jesus was supposed to do, of how to worship. The Lord is saying, examine yourselves because there are some things that the enemy has thrown in the pit amongst us and they become accepted practices of the Epicureans and the Stoics. Paul said, there's this altar sitting 
written here with the inscription of the unknown God. Think about it. He asked the twelve, who do you say I am? They did not know. They did not know. The scary part of this sermon, for me, this part was easy. The question God is now asking you, who do you say I am? Jesus is now asking you, who do you say I am? Don't go about what they said. Don't use the definitions and the terms that they said. How can you now describe me in layman's terms? Reasoning with me. Because a relationship is an exchange. Paul just exemplified what Jesus was doing when he reasoned with them. He was building a relationship. Because how can you speak about something that you got so much conviction about and you ain't got no evidence? He ain't got no evidence. Oh, the Lord will make a way and not and not and not and not. How many times have we heard that we went home and had hell hit us? And then somebody turned around, you tell them what happened. Your faith just ain't strong. You got to believe. You got to believe. The problem is, guess what? What are you believing in? with Jesus. I'm 39 years old and for 25 years I went into church every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday looking at Jesus like he was John the Baptist, like he was Elijah, like he was Paul. Listening to what they had said. And yeah, I had some experiences with them, but what other people told me meant more. That's what I placed the value on. Their relationship. Their testimony. But Jesus is now saying, why don't you have one? Who do you say I am? How can you have faith in the name of Jesus How can you have 
faith in them, and all you got is an association with them. That's your partner for a little bit of time. That's my sugar daddy. And I'm not saying this again to beat up on anybody because I'm guilty. Guilty. In a marriage, two people come together and they learn one another. If they were to sit down at a table and ask each other, who do you say that I am? And that person can't give me an answer, I'm going to have some questions. I'm going to have some doubts. I'm going to lose a little trust there. How can I sleep in the same bed, share the same bank account, share everything that I got, and I don't know who the heck they are? And they don't know me. Jesus is more than a song. He's more than I need to be happy. He's more than I just need to be satisfied. But the question is, who do you say he is? It's a question that I was sitting back on my back porch last night Still puzzled. Because again, he told me, don't go to them religious terms. Don't go to them religious names. Because when you got them religious names, it's real easy. Because guess what? You heard that from somebody. When it's personal, when somebody is your boo thing, or they your significant other, you got a nickname for them. It's a pet name. It's personal. It's something that can't nobody else just walk up and say to them. Or it'll be some furniture moving. So as you begin to think about these things and they develop in your mind, it's now, okay, Lord, if this is what I've been dealing with, if this has been my struggle, if this has been my pain, if this has been my agony, and I know your word to be true because you are the word. I need an answer to the question. Let him who seeks wisdom ask. See, if you know him for yourself, you can say without a doubt, without a doubt, without a doubt, because I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. So when somebody's feeding you a pipeline of bull, it'll flow right up off your back. When you're in the midst of the performance, it'll be like Paul, because Paul said it was his spirit was provoked. It was taking him off. He couldn't deal with it. Because there were a bunch of religious symbols. Well, we can call them little object symbols, but guess what? These symbols and these idols can be thoughts. They can be the very things that mama and daddy and them planted in us that were wrong. See, it's kind of funny with black folks. We had this Slavery mentality still. And it was implanted from us, from our parents and by our society. But we believe in Jesus. We're the most religious folks on the planet. We believe in some Jesus. But we believe in the Jesus that's going to keep us free. But he said, you're free once you accept me. How can you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? That Jesus Christ is Lord when all you know is the name. Casual conversation comes up and it's, man, Denzel Washington look good in that movie. 
Yeah, Denzel got down. You on first name basis with Denzel, but you don't know him. You familiar with him. You might have a partial association. You might share some space. But do you know him? Do you got something in common with him? Had to share the moment together. Broke a little bread. Cracked a couple of jokes. When I sat out there last night, and I wasn't going to say this, but the Lord said it's fine. I remember several occurrences in my life where that encounter with Jesus came. And part of being a man is that you can't cry. And that's the way I was told you can't do that. You ain't no man if you cry. And I found myself crying in church quite frequently, trying to hide it. Well, the Bible says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. Well, all right, Jesus, it's an issue, man, because that was hard. And this is what the Lord said. You remember when you was watching Barbershop 2? And everybody started back in the room, and they was thinking, why is he crying? Ice Cube went in, took his kid to the daycare, and the daycare team, the daycare attendant, was there talking to Ice Cube about whatever the issue that was going on. And Ice Cube goes and grabs a biscuit. And she says, stop. You need to bless that. And Ice Cube said, Jesus wept. And I started crying. In that moment, I had to leave the room to go find out why Jesus wept before Ice Cube answered the question. Because she asked him. Well, it comes to a story where Jesus wept over Lazarus because of the death of Lazarus. Well, I ain't weeping because of death, but I'm weeping because of the way that I am. Prophetically, I was dead. And he said, you remember that? I'm like, yeah. He said, I cried with you. I cry over the dead. Oh, and by the way, you had a second chance just like Lazarus. You were resurrected. I'm sitting on the back porch crying again. And I'm probably the biggest crybaby ever. But I now shifted from what somebody had told me was the right way to go. And it don't make sense that, wait a minute, that was just being a man. Well, how could I be a man of God? If I excluded God. If I couldn't see God that way. Where you are weak, he makes you strong. He turned my whole life around and it brought me to a place where I can now relate. And the way I began to relate with him was through my tears. And I began to find that those tears brought power. It brought clarity. And all of a sudden, I stopped crying for my sins and for the way that I was. And all of a sudden, I was crying for others. And those cries made me pray. So wait a minute. The Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father in a seat on our behalf. Wait a minute, I'm not doing something else that Jesus was doing. So now I can see Jesus in my life. And guess what? He wasn't that far from me. The problem was, I didn't want to see him that way. I didn't really want to acknowledge him for who he is or who that I say he was. I wanted to acknowledge him for what they said he was. Well, I had a, a fair friend with people. It wouldn't sit with me. I couldn't sit still. And I started praying. The person came back with a report. 
Ele tem nada aí. about the encounters that we saw where Jesus showed up in the Bible with somebody else. Trying to get to a place where change would take place in their lives and we learn from the changes in their lives. Holy Spirit just came real bold today. He said, stop looking at them. Put the mirror up in front of you. Holy Spirit today says, examine yourself. Examine your relationship. And where you find the weakness, he will build it. Holy Spirit says today, the canker worm no longer eats through the fabric of your heart. And a canker worm is nothing more than a little bitty pest that comes and eats up trees. It eats up plant life. The prophecy from a few weeks ago was just sow the seed. Don't worry about the harvest. This season is not your season to reap it. Because the seeds that were sown are not yours. Those things don't belong to you. They will kill you. The Lord now says, guess what? Where the poison was poured into the water, I now keep that from killing you. Well, it's been poison poured into the water for years and years and years and years and years. You go generations and generations and generations, and that's what you see. Because what's become a follower of Christ is nothing more than a puppet. Nothing more than somebody who's looking for the recipe of what had happened was then. Second sermon in the church was greater works than these shall you do in my name. How can you do them in his name when all you know is his name? How can you do the greater works when the expectation is still, I want to put the rod out and watch the Red Sea part. Maybe it's just putting your hands on your body and healing yourself. Maybe it's speaking an encouraging word to somebody else about Jesus. Maybe it's the true praise or worship that you bring forth in an atmosphere where it ain't there. Maybe it's the peace that you have when you walk in a room when all hell is breaking loose. But you remain consistent because... You know. You got a definition of who you say he is. 
So when somebody says, oh, he's a prince of peace, you can look at him and be like, hmm, okay. You a little shook over there, though. Lord, do I have permission? No, I can't say that. Okay. Stay consistent. Yeah, yes, Lord. Because a prince got power, a prince got authority. A prince can tell you what to do. You're a subject. Oh, he's the prince of peace, but you the one dictating. Stoic. And then when your hands mess it up, you go and you throw it on the altar of the unknown God. When your mind can't get wrapped around it, you go throw it on the altar of the unknown God. When it get too hard for you, you throw it on the altar of the unknown God. But the question is, if indeed you can't serve two masters, how is it that the God you're worshiping is good enough? But when he can't get it done, you go and throw it on this altar. Two commandments exist. Have no God above me. Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Only two that really matter. So if indeed we break the first commandment because we became our God. We worship the God of Martin Luther King. And it's not to say that, okay, well, he wasn't straight up. But if you look at all the tradition that's wrapped around all of that, the ceremony, the circumstance, his preaching was more on getting free in society than getting free in your spirit. It can't take place unless it takes place in the spirit realm first. That's why it lasted for a little while and it came on back. So now we're trying to figure out what altar we can throw it on so we can get free again. But you're already free. Because you serve the Prince of Peace. The question is, is the peace still in your heart? Is who you say he is deep in here? Is there some type of relationship here that's going to change your situation? Because that's the only thing that's going to change it. I did a little study on the Antichrist. I'm not done yet. But from what I got was, just giving a general definition of it, it is the imitation or the attempted substitution of Christ. What's so sad is the Antichrist was existing from day one. The Antichrist was in the Garden of Eden. The very thing that disturbs your peace is Antichrist. What's sad is the Antichrist watered itself down so bad that we've looked for a person or a thing. But it's now become principles. It's now become actions. And many times it's become us. The scripture in Acts the 17 where it says in him I have my breath and my very being. That means that I don't dwell without him. I can't move without him. I can't do nothing without him. When we take that submittance to his true authority because we a definition of who we say he is according to the word a personal definition see I can read the thus vows here forth and all of that all day long did you really get it whole lot of terms whole lot of terminology but did you really get it 
You remember when you were in school and you were studying your history and they gave you these terms and you were sitting back and you're like, yeah, I know it for the test. But after the test over, you don't pay no attention. And there's an old saying that if you don't study your history, you're bound to repeat it. Right? I just read you the history of those that followed Jesus close. After Jesus died, I just read you the history of those that still supposedly followed Jesus. But neither said knew who he was. They knew the terms. They knew the titles. They knew the names. But they didn't know him. We know the preacher. We know the pastor. We know the minister, we know the prophet, we know the apostle, we know the evangelist, we know the teacher, we know the disciple, we know Christian. But what is it? If you don't have the first term now and know the person of Jesus, the character of Jesus, and it ain't here, what else? What is what are the rest of this about? I'm a Christian. Christian is a follower of Christ. Okay. If I follow Christ, who is Christ? Christ is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh, Jesus is the Son of God. Hmm. Okay. What else? Oh, well, he died for our sins, and he, he turned water to wine, and he walked on some water, and if you notice, I can tell you the story. What else can I tell you about Jesus? What can I tell you about his character? You don't know a person until you know their character. You can't trust a person until you know their character. You just ain't going to willy-nilly just submit yourself to somebody that's an idiot. And I'm not calling Jesus an idiot, but what I'm saying to you is, how can you truly say I'm submitted unto the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings? You don't know nothing about him for real. You just know a story. Martin Luther King preached here and he did that. Malcolm X did this. He went to India and he got a whole new enlightenment. But what do you know about him? You caught the events. Did you dig any further? And in digging further, I just take two questions to you. There's two pieces of history. Who do they say I am? Who did they say happened? Or what did they say happened? What really happened? Who am I? Two sides of the coin. What we've accepted was the emotional side of it that said who they said he was. And they could get emotionally charged behind it because Oh, I could believe in that. Yeah, that dude was hot. He was that thing. He handled this business. So I could believe that. But is your faith really in Jesus? Or is it in the story? See, you meet a person and when you first meet them, they give you their story. It draw you in. Right? Make you feel good about them. I feel sorry for him. It, it hits what? Your emotion. Once you get past that emotion, what do you have? Once you get past the story, what do you have? Because you're a builder. You have to build something on that. And I'm sorry. Emotions fall and they rise. Every day. If I've gotten emotionally charged behind this story, not knowing why he endured that, what he was really going through. And the Bible don't always tell you, but it, it kind of tell you. It, you just got to get out the story of it and get into him. See, 
It talks about that suffering. And if you paid attention, it was my tears that gave me a different revelation of it. Because I was in the midst of suffering with myself, with my own image, with who I was supposed to be and who I wanted to be. Who I was supposed to be and who they said I was supposed to be. See, when you can answer that question, your identity will change. Go back in your Old Testament. Every time somebody encountered God, what did God do? To change their name. Because no longer was God just a story. No longer was God just an event. No longer was God just this dude that... He was just going to make magical things happen to help them get out of Israel, help the Israelites get out of Egypt. And help them win a couple of wars. Once they encountered God, there was a change. And if you paid attention, none of them fell by the wayside afterwards. They knew that they knew that they knew that they knew what they knew. Because God wasn't that far off. Today's message is to begin to challenge you in your faith. And the challenge is coming because the tests are about to come. And when the tests come, if you don't know the answer to that question, And for some of us in the room, the test going to be so dressed up and looking real pretty and real shiny. Got to have that. But when you know that you know that you know that you know, you can spot that counterfeit. These are the end of days. And in the end of days, many deceivers shall come to deceive you. To turn you away from the ways of Christ. How easy is it to do so when your vision of them is blurry? How easy is it for me to teach you something demonic if you have no clue who Christ is? If you don't know who he is to you, it got to start there. And then you build, and you build, and you build, and you build. And what you'll find is, when folks come trying to burn your building down, it ain't going nowhere. When that's tried by fire, the fire ain't got no chance in hell. Just like the three Hebrew boys, thrown in the fire furnace. That fire couldn't do nothing to them. They came out unseen. It was a test of their faith. And if we're not cautious and forewarned in our, our faith wall, in our identity in him, in his identity in us, it ain't hard to trick you. It ain't hard for somebody to walk up to you and give you a word and it just sounds good. And all of a sudden, you go running into a false reality that just took you what they said he was. And I'm not telling you to close your ears because possibilities are unlimited. But the difference being because you know in your heart how he deals with you, how he's working with you. Because y'all in relationship, y'all buddy, buddy, cuddle buddies, kiss them up, mm -hmm, buddies. Can't nobody slide in between that. That relationship will mean that much more to you and ain't nobody going to jump in. The whole key in the devil's mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. Well, if he can kill what you think about yourself in him and steal what you think about him in you, your salvation is being destroyed. Because again, you must
must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That belief is, I can't believe in something that I don't know. I can't believe in a stranger. It got to be something about that character that's going to make me go all in. So the Holy Spirit today challenges us all to examine who we say he is. Because going into the next season, we will be equipped to go all in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you for a very definitive word. For the challenge and even the opportunity to grow closer to you and move past an emotional setting. To move past the watered down doctrine. To move past our watered down thoughts and mindsets. Father, in the name of Jesus, if there's any doubt in them right now, we pray that you come in and you minister to that doubt. That you reveal yourself in totality. Because you said that you're not a respecter of persons. If you can show yourself to Moses, you can show yourself to us. If, you, if Jesus could stand before 5,000 in the multitude, Lord, give the revelation of being one of 5,000 so that we would be able to get a glimpse of his character. So that we may know who he is. For Lord, we do not want to be ill-equipped on the day of judgment because if Jesus was to ask us that question, we want to have a prepared reason, a dedicated reason as to why we serve, as to why we love, as to why we believe in you, in your purpose, in your love, in your works. We do not want to be one of those in which Jesus says, get away from me, you work of iniquity, because I never knew you. But we want to be called one that Jesus calls free. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your clear and defined revelation. And we ask for a quick work in it today. We ask that you deal with our hearts and expose what does not belong when it comes to the revelation of you. We ask that you tear down every wall that we built because we didn't want to expose it to you. We ask right now for your courage, for your compassion, for your love, for your testimony, and for your character. So that we would not be deceived. So that we could grow in confidence in you. And what you're doing in us. I speak to the spirit man right now in each person. Commanding you to rise. To rise up and overcome. To rise up and conquer. The past. To rise up and conquer. Because Lord you said that we could tread upon serpents heads. That we could drink poison and that it shall not kill us. So Lord we call out the poison. And we ask for your courage right now. To stomp in victory. So spirit man rise and stomp. Spirit man rise and rejoice. Spirit man rise and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Any questions? That was a good food. I got a comment. I got a question. I got a comment. Like you said, you were sitting outside and you thought about that and for some miraculous reason, I've been thinking about that all week. 
the same thing. And I just happened to write it down. I just happened to write it in my book, my notes. Mm -hmm. And I, first I'm going to read the notes that you said that I, I really want to read. The ones that I, they really spoke to me. And who, who is Jesus and who am I? We, we only see Jesus when in trouble, pain, and our need. Hearing the word of God, relationship with God, followers of Christ, relationships, and that relationship stuck for that's what I've been thinking about. And I remember I wrote this down. Let's see. Where are you going? Where are you going? Can you take me with you? For I am lost and I can't be found. Where are you going? Can I skip the road with you? I will skip the road and I shall dance. We will, we will place, no, we will place a pebble in our shoes and then we call the pebble there. We will watch, you will watch me walk and we will walk and walk. And when we both have had enough, we'll take the pebble from our shoe and you will say, meet your new world. And, I mean, that's just, it's got, I mean, it's, I'm blowing, it blows my mind. That you just happen to preach on what I've been thinking about all week. Praise God. Yes. I mean, it, it, I, I, I'll make a confession, you know, because I've been tripping off of um, a word God gave me about not advertising. Mm -hmm. And I've really wanted to advertise because I want to to more people. And what he said to me was this. If I started with 12, why do you need so many? Your job is to go make disciples of men. You can get a word you can have a word, it can match the word. But if you're limited in who the word is to you, that word will sit there and it'll just be like, I know what you said, but I know what you said, but I, I know what you said, but and eventually he'll be like, why are you still why are you still saying but? Why are you still at but? Deal with it. I'm going to give you a select few for you to send out. And then I'm going to send you another flock in. And they'll come back. Your job is to equip people so that they don't get tricked. So that they ain't out here sucking on sweet candy. That ain't me. This was the beginning of a series that I'm going to be teaching. Because the key is, it does me no good to teach you the character of God and the character of Jesus if you don't have a glimpse of them already. Because I'm no different, or you would be no different than Jesus coming and saying, what did he say about me? See, this is where iron begins to sharpen iron. Because a teaching like this not only makes you now examine yourself, but now it makes you go read. It now makes you accountable to learn the character. In no other church, and I, I've been on church for a long time, I've not heard not one time. And I was telling Andre this last night, I ain't never heard nobody preach that. Nobody ever cared about who we said Jesus was. Because they're always saying, you got to go with this, you got to go with this, you got to go with this, you got to go with this. This don't settle until you have an idea first. If your foundation is watered down, you're going to get watered down Jesus. If your foundation ain't set up to where you want to grow with him, you're just going to grow And all of a sudden, you're going to wonder why everything hurt because he's steadily cutting, trying to get this out your life and get you to grow in the right direction. But you're trying to go this way because of what you heard.
Everything I gave you today was in the Word of God. It was right there. And what he told me was, this is a word church. Yes, you were prophet, but this is a word church. And if indeed my word don't hold nothing, me talking ain't getting nothing done. Because they won't know me. Unless they can see it before their faces. So yeah, I, I call I call a good blood whooping too. Be looking out. This one will get out there early. I put the other sermons out there. Um, there will be a high chair episode coming out of Luke 9 this week as well. And it's called Though You Have Little, Much Is Headed Your Way. Um, it's a faith building. Especially after this butt whooping, we all need some type of encouragement. And oddly enough, Jesus just was like, dude, I just did the encouragement of a couple of scriptures up. The problem being, if indeed you see it from those stoic eyes or those Epicurean eyes, it just looked like a miracle. But I'm really establishing something in you, even in the miracle that I performed for others. So, This is going to be a, uh, you got to roll ahead, y'all. I'm just going to be real. Because we, we about to do some serious character. And we started last week with Jehovah, my banner. Don't be weary and well doing. We started there. Because that's a characteristic of God. That he'll jump out front. Because he don't want you to work yourself out. And again, I can tell you, you can go through the Bible and you can find all these different names. But again, if Jesus ain't your color buddy, it's just a name. Kind of like if you don't know the characteristic of your pastor, he's just pastor such and such. You don't know the man. So the Lord's going to take us on a ride where we're going to begin to discover the man. We, we, we're not going to be on the history of it, the events. We're going to dig a little deeper. We're going to go a little further, and we're going to come out of religion. He's sick of it. I mean, I'm working on a message that I know is going to be about a month or so down the road. And I was telling my mom about it this morning. And I'm sitting there and I'm already ready to cry. Because when I say that Antichrist then came in and then did a woo on the church. When he showed me this one and he brought it back to my remembrance before I opened the church, I was visiting every week. I would just go visit the church and then I would go to where I, what I call my church home. And just showed me and he brought back to my remembrance all of those things that provoked me that put me in war mode that made me so on edge that a few of the churches I ended up walking out of and he said I want you to understand he can steal the word from them. They can't draw closer. There's a scripture, I believe it's in Matthew, the 13th chapter, where it talks about the parable of the sower and the types of soil that he sows on. And the first type of soil that he sows on, when he sows the seed, the birds come and snatch the seed. The second type of soil was a rocky soil, and the sun scorched it. The third type of soil was a bunch of thickets, kind of like thorn bushes. It choked it out. Well, everybody 
everybody looks at that and they say, well, this is the, the mindset that people are in. These are the works of the Antichrist. Any seed from God will manifest. Think about it. If God gave it to you to sow, and you sowing it, it's going to manifest. God is not a man that he shall lie. He is not slack in his promises. So if he put it in your hands, he put it in your mouth, it's going to manifest. Question being, how many times have we had that seed that he sowed in us? And it got stacked by birds because of how we saw him. How many times did he get burned up because of how we saw him? Choked out because of the way that we saw him. It was literally, I don't want your seed. It was our rejection. And that's a work of the Antichrist because anything that's in rebellion to Christ is Antichrist. So, that's the lessons that are forthcoming, and I'll just be honest with you, there are a ton of them. We'll branch off with, you know, fear of the Lord and that honor because of how he honors us. And it'll actually branch off into praise. And then you'll really be, your eyes will be totally opened. So, get ready. I got a lot of studying on my hands. A whole lot of study. A whole lot of study. I've I've been keeping my, I got a Bible in almost every room now. I'm going to blow this sermon with you. Huh? He showed me that you was going to preach on the day. Did he? Yeah, he had me looking at Job, though. He's challenging Job. I was about to go there, too. Like, stiff, stand up like a man, and you hear what I got to say. That's my own type of question. Yes, sir. That's crazy. Job 40. <laughs> I didn't even, even get to the, the, the scripture I wanted to preach get to preach and Peter because that's next week. Was it working? Did, did it do what it was supposed to do? Oh, do me a favor, y'all. His birthday was this week, so we need to sing him happy birthday. We're gonna embarrass him on camera. <laughs> Have a seat, man.